Now, um, I must admit, when we were thinking about literacy in all its forms, uh, I confess that, that um, transgender literacy wasn't one that immediately occurred to me, so I'm really looking forward to this presentation to find out a bit more about it. So, um, I, I, I welcome Cheryl Morgan from the Diversity Trust. We good, yeah, okay. So, yeah, first of all, I hadn't realised I was going to be um, being introduced by a couple of Scots people. So, I, as a Welsh person, I shall apologise in advance for Saturday. <laughs> uh, it's not that we want to beat you, but if we don't, the English might win the championship and nobody wants that, do they? <laughs> Uh, also, I'm delighted to be speaking to an audience of, of librarians. Uh, amongst other things, I'm a literary critic and a book publisher, so librarians are amongst my favourite people. But neither of those two things are to do with what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I'm here to talk about transgender people. I do that um, as a job with the Diversity Trust, uh, so thank you for inviting me. And I want to start with what I call the traditional view of gender, which is that there are blue people and pink people, and never the twain shall meet. But that's a very simplistic idea of gender, and really it's, only a, it's a view that we've only had in Western Europe and its colonies for the past 300 years or so. That if you look at other places around the world, other times in history, views on gender were much more sophisticated. And one of the reasons for that is that um, biology is really very, very messy. If you talk to university-level biologists, they'll tell you that they really, the, the whole sex thing is incredibly complicated, that they don't understand fully how sexed bodies come into existence. And that my first book recommendation of today is this one by Sarah Richardson, which is a history of biology's attempts to understand uh, sex and, and gender. It's actually quite sophisticated um, you know, biology in, in some places. It was beyond my understanding. But it's also got some really great history, including the great XYY panic of the 1970s, which is highly amusing. Um, so what actually determines sex, as it were? Well, there are chromosomes, obviously. That's, that's what people on social media fixate upon. But the chromosomes have to switch on specific genes in order for things to happen, the growth of the embryo. You have to make gonads, either testes or ovaries, and those have to make sex hormones, either testosterone or estrogen. And that, in turn, will prompt the growth of internal sex organs, external genitalia, and after puberty, various secondary sex characteristics. Now, if you look at me, my chromosomes are male. Um, the genes presumably worked in a, the normal male way. Um, I don't have any gonads at all. My body runs on oestrogen rather than testosterone, HRT for the win. Uh, I, I don't have a womb, um, but I do have all of the, the normal girly bits down there. And I also have the um, female secondary sex characteristics. So in terms of male and female, I'm about 50-50. But the female bits are largely the visible things, which is good. Um, now, human beings um, very naturally have all sorts of variations of sex characteristics, and they're lumped under this term of intersex. There are, there are many, many different variations, over a hundred catalogued ones. They're often called intersex conditions, but intersex people don't like us using that term because, as far as they're concerned, it, it's no more a condition than having green eyes or red hair or whatever. Um, but I just want to highlight um, a couple of uh, particular conditions in that these uh, ladies in the photograph all have XY chromosomes, and yet they were assigned female at birth, they grew up as girls, they're living as adult women. And the reason they're like that is because they have uh, what the medical people call complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, which means that their body don't react to testosterone. So you know, they, they have the Y chromosome, everything is set up to say make this baby a boy, but the body doesn't recognise the signals and nothing much happens. And consequently, you get people with Y chromosomes who look and feel conventionally female in most cases. Um, now, mostly these people don't have the internal uh, sex organs, they are no wombs, um, but there is at least one well-documented case of somebody with an XY chromosome who got pregnant, gave birth to a daughter with XY chromosomes. So the whole thing about why chromosome means a man, sorry, busted. All right? uh, and you know, there's also something called Swire syndrome, which means that your body is incapable of making testosterone. Um, if you're a mother and you've had boys, you will have XY cells in your body perfectly naturally. The whole thing is, is really very complicated. 
Now, then we come on to the social side, which is um, what we call gender. And that, too, is very complicated because we mean different things by it. Sometimes we mean things which are very clearly socially constructed, right? Jobs for boys and jobs for girls, right? We, we don't believe in that anymore, apart from the Prime Minister, apparently. Um, <laughs> and, and then there's things like what you wear and how you behave, and that, too, can vary with, with uh, social circumstances and culture and time of history and whatever. So, for example, at the top, we've got the musician K.D. Lang, who is performing butch lesbian. Nothing to do with saying I'm a man. If you're a lesbian, you're not saying I'm a man. That's, that would be silly. Um, at the bottom, we've got Louis XIV performing powerful male ruler in the 17th century with his red high heel shoes, stockings, garters, lace, curly wig. You know, it's not exactly the Vladimir Putin look, is it? <laughs> but in the 17th century, that was the thing. Right, so all of this gender stuff seems to be very malleable, very socially constructed. But then we come on to gender identity, which is a thing that we talk about with reference to trans people. Um, and that's much more of an internal sense of who you are. And we have discovered by trial and error over many decades that you cannot cure it by sending people to asylums and giving them aversion therapy and electroshock therapy. It's been tried, it doesn't work, right? Um, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is, is that actually it's quite solid in everybody. Everybody has a gender identity, right? If I were to offer you a million pounds in return for which you had to undergo gender reassignment and live the rest of your life in a different gender, would anybody take me up on it? Right? There's, there's normally one or two whose eyes light up at the million <laughs> pounds. Um, but, yeah, the, and the reason that you're all shaking your heads is because you all have a gender identity. You're very sure of who you are, you're very happy with who you are, and you don't want to be one of those other types of people. And it's exactly the same for trans people, except when we're growing up, people keep telling us that we're something that we know we're not. And once we actually go through the transition process and we're able to live as ourselves, we become much happier as a result. Now, nobody knows why this happens. You know, it could be a whole collection of, of intersex things that we don't yet understand. And the chances of our understanding it in the near future are not good because the easy experiments to do will be messing with human embryos and nobody's going to be doing that. Right? Um, so we don't know. But the Endocrine Society in 2017 put out a press release saying that they believed that trans identities are so solid, so uh, impossible to disrupt by psychiatric cures, that there must be some sort of biological underpinning. Now, I don't know whether they're right or not, I, and really I don't care. What I care about is, is that trans people get proper treatment from you know, the medical profession, that there are uh, allowed to transition and become happy people. And I'm, I'm quite nervous about tests for transness because I think it's very complicated and you might end up missing people. Um, so that's what trans is. A few things now about what trans isn't. It is no longer a mental illness. Now, mental illness is a very complicated thing. We've been using it a lot for social control over many decades now. But as of 2013 in the USA and July last year in the rest of the world, being trans is in of itself no longer a mental illness. It's also, oh, and, and there's another book, I'm sure you've got copies of that in your library, <laughs> and the ICD as well. Um, trans is also not a sexuality. You know, trans people do not undergo gender reassignment to have sex in weird and wonderful ways. Right? Trans people exhibit the same range of sexualities as anybody else. It's not dangerous. Trans people are not predisposed to become sex criminals, which might seem obvious, but the whole panic at the moment about trans people in bathrooms is based on the idea that trans people are naturally predisposed to be rapists. Right? Being trans is not contagious, and that also should be non-contentious, except that there's a whole moral panic going on at the moment about it being a social contagion, it even got as far as a proposed bill in the, the Parliament of South Dakota recently. Uh, if ever you hear people talking about something called rapid onset gender dysphoria, that is the assumption that being trans is contagious and that by meeting trans people, children can catch transness. Right? But trans is not simple. Um, you know, the trans community is very, very varied. And consequently, that makes it quite difficult to get a handle on 
uh, how to interact with trans people. And when I do these talks, people are always asking me about terminology. What are the right words, Cheryl will say, because we don't want to offend people. And that's perfectly understandable. But I don't know what the right words are anymore. I'm not 16 now. You know, <laughs> yeah, I know I look it, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> Now, young people are, are very, very inventive and they're always coming up with new classifications and things. And it, it's hard for me as a professional in the business to keep up. So I don't expect you to as well, but I'll try and give you a bit of uh, a, a grounding in it. So I think everybody is familiar with LGBT, right? Right? Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. And then we get alphabet soup, <laughs> right? Because there are so many other things as well. And in order to get away from alphabet soup, what we have is what we call umbrella terms. Right? An umbrella term is something that tries to cover a wide range of things in one simple term. And the obvious example of that is BME, black and minority, min <laughs> black and minority ethnic, right? which covers more than half of the world's population. And you can quite understand why somebody would say, I'm not BME, I'm Chinese. And it's the same with these terms, that, that these are useful terms, but you will always find people who want to stand outside of those and say, no, this is my specific identity. So we have trans, first of all, which covers the entire community, a bit, um, but trans can be divided into whether people undergo medical transition or whether they don't. It can be divided into whether people who are trans identify with one of the two poles of the gender binary or whether they identify outside it. And if you do identify outside it, what we call non-binary, you can do so in many different ways. You can be somebody who thinks you're something somewhere in the middle. You can be somebody who is quite happy doing either and will flip-flop between the two. You can be somebody for whom the whole question of gender just just your head in and you wish people would stop asking you about it, please. And you can be somebody who thinks that your gender is not on the spectrum, but somewhere out in five-dimensional space, somewhere near Alpha Centauri or something. But why not? Um, then we have gender non-conforming people, who are people who are very comfortable with the gender that they were assigned at birth, but who adopt the gender presentation that is socially expected for the other binary gender. If you think, for example, of butch lesbians or of male transvestites, as they tended to be called cross-dressers, the, the, the common term these days. So those two are part of this continuum of non-conformingness. Uh, uh, then you have cultural, culturally specific terms. In India, we have hijra and various other terms. Big country, India, lots of different languages. Uh, in North America, we have two-spirit, which is actually a term that was adopted in 1990 by the North American tribes because they all had their own names for, uh, for trans people. Um, you find in Polynesia, every island has its own name for trans people. And all of these things are very specific to those cultures. That if you are a Hijra, if you are a, a two-spirit people, a person in the Navajo or a two-spirit person in the Lakota, um, your identity will be in part moulded by the culture that you live in and your understanding of yourself will be moulded by that. We have intersex people, of course. Uh, most of whom are actually happy with the gender that they were assigned at birth, but some of them will identify as trans as well. Some of them are still operated on as babies in order to, scare quotes, fix their ambiguous genitalia. Uh, and finally, we have cisgender, which is probably most of you, which is people who are comfortable with the gender that they were assigned at birth. Now, you're all medical people, so you've done Latin. You know that cis and trans are just Latin prefixes, right? Good. Um, now... You know, a long time ago, people used to think there were only two types of people, men and women. Well, actually, they thought there were at least three because past societies were more flexible than we are. But say, you know, 18th century Britain, people thought there were men and women. And then 19th century people, we invented homosexuals and heterosexuals. So we had four sorts of people. But really, people are way much more complicated than that. And this is a, a teaching tool developed by a student organisation in Los Angeles where they're talking about a bunch of different characteristics all of which come in three different flavours and most of which can be on a sliding scale because that's the sort of complexity that you need in order to model the complexity of real human beings. Sadly, I don't have time to go into that in detail now, but happy to answer questions about it later. 
Um, so, just in terms of a few definitions and stuff, this is, this is the issue that all minority groups have, that you have stereotypes that, which may or may not be harmful in and of themselves. There are some stereotypes that aren't harmful at all, but some of them definitely are. And if left to fester, those can grow into prejudices based on those stereotypes, which then can cause people to be actively discriminatory, um, and that's where the real problems lie. But you always need to remember, of course, that there are power dynamics at work here. That if you are um, a member of a, a small minority, it's very hard to be discriminatory against the majority because you're only a, a small group of people and they have all the, the power. Um, it doesn't, uh, doesn't work the same way the other way around. A um, few words that you might have heard in connection with trans people. So transphobia, obviously, you know, same as, as homophobia or arachnophobia or whatever. Um, but, but note also the denial of the validity of trans identities. You see a lot of people on social media saying, I'm not transphobic, but... Yeah? <laughs> you know, um, you know what follows on from that. Uh, misgendering... Um, and everybody gets it wrong at some point or other, but if you deliberately and persistently use the wrong pronouns for, for somebody, then that obviously is a, a form of aggression and uh, shouldn't be condoned. Um, and then dead naming is something you see a lot in the newspapers where journalists will use the birth name of a trans person uh, rather than the name that they use at the moment, even though they've legally changed their name in many cases, and they'll use that birth name in order to imply that that's who the person really is, and that their current identity is some sort of, of fake. So those are some things to avoid. Um, now, we don't really know how many trans people there are because it's actually quite difficult to measure. I mean, we know how many people actually go through the, the medical process, but there are many people who are not yet doing that, either they, because they haven't come out or because they don't necessarily want medical intervention. And the government produced a report last year in which they estimated the UK trans population was between 200,000 and 500,000. So we're looking at maybe between half a percent and one percent, maybe, because they're, they're probably underestimating it. Um, the number of young people coming forward is growing very, very rapidly. And part of that is, is a result of the increased visibility and parents now being aware that if they have a genuinely trans child, that it's so much better for them to make a start early on. But also, there were inevitably will be people who are concerned that they don't really understand trans stuff. And really, you know, if, if you've got a little girl who plays football, it doesn't mean that she's trans. It just means she's a little girl that, that plays football. There is increasing visibility of non-binary um, patients. That doesn't mean that non-binary is a new thing. It just means that the medical establishment, in particular the gender clinics, are much more relaxed now. They're not... I mean, back when I transitioned, if you didn't fit firmly into socially stereotyped gender roles, they would kick you out. So I had to turn up to appointments with psychiatrists in a pretty dress with long hair and jewellery and makeup and, and all the mannerisms and everything. I, I learned to do girl because I had to. Right. Um, but you don't necessarily have to do that now if it's not comfortable to you, and that's why there are mo a lot more non-binary people around. Um, in terms of the care pathway, this I mean, I'll um, go through the thing for adults. The, the thing for children is a little bit more complicated. If people are interested, we can maybe talk later. But as an adult, you should be referred to a gender clinic by your GP. Um, unfortunately, the waits now are around two years for first appointment, um, so there are real issues there. At the gender clinic, if you get there, there will be a psychiatric assessment to decide if you're somebody who can benefit from medical assistance in your transition. Uh, there'll be hormonal intervention, firstly to block um, what your gonads are currently doing, um, and then cross-sex hormones to essentially put you through a second puberty. Um, there, uh, there will be a requirement to live for a certain amount of time in the, the gender that you say you are, um, which is, is largely for the benefit of the, the doctors so that they can say, yeah, yeah, that person is, is not fibbing me or, or you know, whatever. Um, because if they're going to re recommend people for irreversible surgery, then they do actually need to have a certain amount of confidence. Um, but the actual time that people are required to do this has been coming down. When I went through it, it was a minimum of two years. Now it's more like one and a half years, but one year for somebody who's a really obvious case. So the gender clinics are getting much better at understanding this and recognising 
um, who is suitable for treatment. Surgical intervention, if necessary, um, happens uh, if you're over 18, uh, and there is no one the surgery. There are all sorts of different things to do, even for, for trans women, where they can do a lot of stuff in one operation, there are other things that you might want. And at that point, you get discharged into GP care because if they've taken away your gonads, you will need uh, hormone supplies for the rest of your life, in my case, HRT patches. Um, and here we have you know, a, a certain amount of conflict at the moment. The Royal College of GPs is very keen to wash its hands of care for trans people. There's a big dispute going on at the moment. I think most of that is around looking after people before they get to the gender clinic. But frankly, you know, what are people going to do? Because the gender clinics aren't going to get any more money and GPs washing their hands off it is not very helpful. But equally, after, uh, after surgery, if GPs say looking after trans people is too complicated, what are trans people to do? Um, which is why I use a private GP, because I haven't been able to get my hormone prescriptions any other way. Um, you will hear a lot of stuff in the media about people who undergo gender re reassignment and then regret it. But if you look at the actual numbers, it's really very small. Um, at the last conference of the, uh, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, which was in Argentina late last year, somebody from Charing Cross Hospital produced a poster where they, they'd done a survey of uh, several hundred of their clients, I think, and, and they said that regret was around 1%, but of those 1%, many of the people backed out of the process for social reasons, and some of them would re-enter the process again later. So the actual regret level is really very, very low, and probably getting lower as, you know, first of all, we get more comfortable with non-binary people, and secondly, as, as the gender clinics get better at their jobs. And the purpose of this gender reassignment is a happy patient. It shouldn't be to force anybody through transition if they don't want it. It shouldn't be to force people into socially mandated stereotypes. Uh, now, we at the Diversity Trust have done quite a bit of work with local trans people. We did a survey back in 2017, uh, and we were funded for that by um, a consortium of local health watch groups. Um, and what we found is really quite depressing. Um, a lot of people waiting a long time, people with anxiety, depression, self-harm, uh, suicide attempts, um, and uh, mental health conditions as a result. 30% of our respondents said that they felt discriminated against in the healthcare system. And those results, excuse me, those results are by no means unusual. Right? Um, there's a survey here of trans people in education. A lot of you people work in universities. Uh, more than a third of trans students questioned in 2009 feared losing financial support from their families if they came out as trans. More than a quarter had taken time out from their courses due to abuse, stress, and so on. Um, and part of the stress that happens is that trans people can often be erased uh, or, or even vilified in course material. That There are uh, academics around the country who are deeply transphobic uh, and who make a career of it on social media. So you certainly, as a trans person, wouldn't want to be in that person's class. Uh, if you do need help, do ask the student union because they generally know quite a lot about this stuff. Uh, Stonewall did a survey of trans rights back in 2018, and again, the numbers are pretty depressing. Um, so you, they've got a lot of homelessness, for example, a lot of that is because young trans people being rejected by their families, but also adult trans people b being unable to get work and therefore losing their homes. So uh, it's, uh, it can be quite tough out there. Um, uh, almost half of trans people don't feel comfortable using public toilets. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to all of the fuss in the media where you know, people are now looking out for trans people. But personally, you know, I've been using women's toilets for about 25 years and nobody's ever challenged me. Um, I have a good friend who's a butch lesbian and she gets challenged pretty much every time she goes into a woman's toilet. Um, so, yeah, this, uh, that's not working. Um, um, relevant to you, more than a third of trans university students uh, told Stonewall that they'd experienced negative comments or behaviour from staff at their universities. Um, and in a separate investigation, Stonewall said that 20% of trans people had been pressured to undergo conversion therapy by NHS staff. And if you remember, I said earlier, conversion therapy does not work. 
um, there's no point in sending people to that. Uh, so how can you help? What can you do as people who interact with students and, and other customers who might be trans? Well, the starting point is simply to respect trans people's identities. You know, if somebody is presenting in a certain way, don't look at them, at them as if they're odd or perverted or whatever. Don't, uh, you know, assume that pronouns and um, whatever, and, and, you know, if somebody has a deep voice, assume that they must be a man, despite, you know, regardless of how they're dressed. Um, but also understand that students may be going, undergoing through a lengthy and difficult transition process. There's a particular issue with trans people at university because if you remember, um, first of all, of course, they're, they're now newly adults, right? So they're away from their parents. They can make decisions about their own lives. But also the rules about getting access to hormones, getting access to surgery, hormones at 16, surgery at 18. So young trans people... Uh, will be going through the process, right? And that process is long and it's stressful, and it is to a certain extent like going through puberty, you know? I mean, we've all done it, haven't we? And it, it can be really quite unpleasant. Uh, you know, imagine, in my case, I did it in my late 30s, trying to hold down a professional job at the same time, and this was not good, right? So it can be very hard for these, these young people going through that. Um, you may get requests to, to change records, and there's no reason why you shouldn't do so. You know, people do change their names all the time, they, and people change their genders occasionally as well. Um, it would be good if there was information about trans issues available in, uh, in the library, um, because access to resources is always good. When I was growing up as a kid, there, there was nowhere I could go. You know, it wasn't talked about in the newspapers or on television. We only had two television channels anyway. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, and, and if I went to the library, what would I look for? I didn't know the word. These days, of course, it's much better, but the resources still have to be there. And ideally, you want good material and not necessarily what you find on Wikipedia. Um, and do, if you have the opportunity, advocate for trans people in the university community, because there will be people out there who are anti-trans. Uh, there's a great deal of effort happening at the moment by the media to... Uh, to make people anti-trans, so we do need all the help we can get. Um, the question about how do you address people often comes up, um, and I've got another book recommendation here. This is not a medical book. This is more my sort of book. Um, it's, it's a secondary world fantasy novel, um, and in that world that Rachel Hartman created for her book, there is a city where people have six different genders. Now, I'm not going to go into all six, but one of those genders is for strangers. Why do you have gender for strangers? Well, because until you've been introduced to somebody and you've had the opportunity to ask politely how they want to be addressed, you don't know what gender they are. So you have a separate gender for strangers and you use that until you've been introduced. Right? It would be great if we had that in English, but we don't, and we have to muddle along as best we, uh, we can. Um, but do ask, um, and try to do so in private and politely, uh, and try to remember what people say. Um, you know, it would be useful, of course, if we had a, uh, an official gender-neutral term. In Finland, they only have one pronoun, which is used for everybody. In Sweden, they have three, and they're increasingly using the gender-neutral one for children in order to try and get them away from all the pink and blue nonsense. Now, in the UK, in English we have singular they, and singular they is not ungrammatical, no matter what people might say on social media. Right? Somebody left their mobile phone behind after the conference. I wonder if they'll be back for it. Right? I've just used there and they in a singular context in a sentence. Now, there are ways in which using they feels uncomfortable to us, but English is a very, very flexible language. It's always evolving, and I expect that in... 10 years' time, we'll be using singular they very, very naturally. Um, everybody makes mistakes, as I said earlier. You're not going to get it right all the time. The important thing is not to avoid mistakes. The important thing is to be able to apologise. Right? Um, Apologising is a skill. Many celebrities don't have it. Right? <laughs> they say foolish things in the media, and then they say, oh, I'm sorry you were offended. Right? I mean, that which puts everything onto the person that's been offended. Um, so you do need to learn how to apologise. And of course, once you have apologised, and you have to mean it, and you have to try not to get it wrong in future. And if you do that, most people will be perfectly happy. Um, 
You probably have bathrooms in your libraries. Um, there is zero evidence of trans people har harassing women in bathrooms. Uh, I don't know of anybody who's been prosecuted over it. Um, there are, is now a lot of evidence of um, uh, butch lesbians and other gender non-conforming women, people who've had mastectomies because of cancer, for example, being harassed in bathrooms because they are perceived to be trans women. So there's a big problem there, but not a problem with trans women. Um, but different trans people will have different issues regarding bathrooms, and maybe those issues will, will change at different stages during their transition. Um, you know, either, um, for example, with trans men, until they've actually had certain surgeries, they will still menstruate, right? Um, and therefore, they will still need access to tampon disposal. Um, and trans women may feel uncomfortable using a woman's toilet when they're at the beginning of the process, and as the medicine works its magic, they'll, and they've had more experience, they'll be much more confident and happy to uh, go pee where they want to. Um, something that you should always ask yourselves is whether single stall rooms need to be gendered. Right? It, it drives me crazy when I go into coffee shops and there are two absolutely identical um, toilets with full height lockable doors, one labelled men and one, one labelled women. Why? I mean, why do you need to make that, that change? Um, and do think about the signs that you use. You know, this is a perfectly acceptable sign for a toilet. Right? Everybody will understand what you mean. You don't have to have some picture of somebody who's half male and half female to indicate a gender neutral toilet. And please, please do not repurpose the disabled bathroom and say this is for everybody now. Because disabled people need their special toilets. Right? Some of them can't get to the toilet very often. And if they get there and they discover that they can't get in because everybody else is using it because you've made it gender neutral, they're going to be very upset and they'll probably have a rant about trans people on social media, and then we'll have to apologise for it. And, you, know, uh, you know how it goes. Ah, so, finally, I want to make some book recommendations. These are two books that every medical library should stock. Um, ben Vincent's book uh, is very new, and it's very up-to-date on um, everything to do with looking after trans people. It, it's short, it's practical, it's full of useful information. Uh, it's got a forward by Stuart Lorimer from Charing Cross Hospital, so it's got the stamp of approval um, of uh, our leading gender clinic as well. Um, Ruth Pierce's book is longer, it's more historical, it's talking about how we got where we are. Uh, it's quite angry in places because Ruth, like me, transitioned quite a while ago and has you know, had negative interactions, shall we say, with the health service. But it is, again, a very, very powerful book. And you know, Ruth has been at university studying this stuff for a long time, and it's definitely worth uh, reading. Um, other stuff that you might want to put in, there's a, a, a great book by Christine Burns just about the history of the trans community in the UK. Um, and interestingly, if you're, you're interested in, in trans history, trans men seem to have an affinity for medicine. Uh, so James Barry, Alan Hart, Michael Dillon, Richard Curtis, they, they're all trans men who have made their names in the medical profession. Uh, Barry, in particular, is, is uh, as far as we know, the first person to <coughs> perform a caesarean operation in which both the mother and the baby lived. So that, that's quite a thing. And Michael Dillon uh, was way ahead of uh, the rest of the medical profession in his recommendations for how trans people should be treated. Uh, if you want some theory, um, this, um, first of all, Julia Serrano is probably the, the leading trans theorist in the world. She's based in California. But we've also got C.N. Lester, who's actually a, a classical musician, but they've also written this uh, wonderful book called Trans Like Me, which is, is a very good read and a good introduction to trans issues. Um, and yeah, this is, this is basically what it's all about. Um, we would just like you to be nice to us, please. You know, just like you're nice to everybody else. Any questions? I think we have time, don't we? some of your references to the diversity trust and what the trust does and some of the issues in terms of equity and access to health services 
are there things that we can sign up to get to, you know, get more information about in terms of raising issues, raising awareness? Okay, so the Diversity Trust is an organisation which provides um, education, training on diversity issues. Basically, we work around the Equality Act. And as you probably know, the Equality Act has nine protected characteristics. So what we do is we will offer courses on... Uh, we, I think we don't, we don't cover all of them at the moment, but we are, are looking to. Um, and it's part of our policy that the people doing the training are people with lived experience of the area in which they're training. So I head up the, the trans training. Um, we, we have you know, gay and lesbian people who will head up the LGB training. We have people of colour who will head up the um, race training and so on. Uh, so that's what we do. Um, and you know, we are available to come and do training. We have worked with quite a lot of universities, particularly around the, the South West. Um, and we're you know, always happy to come and, and talk to basically anybody that wants to learn this stuff uh, and provide advice as to, to how to make your operations more trans-friendly. You're looking at someone who has an academic specialism in transgender characters in science fiction and fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so good on the mimetic fiction, um, but it's out there, and there are other people that can advise us on that. So, yeah, there are, well, I can certainly help you put together reading lists. Be delighted to. See you mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's very patchy, um, postcode lottery type thing. Uh, we work very closely with our local health watch organisations, um, and some of them are very, you know, um, well on with this. Um, health watch Bristol, in particular, have been enormously supportive, uh, and health watch North Somerset actually ran the the group that funded our work. Um, you know, I've just started working with my local health watch in Wiltshire and you know, they, um, they're lovely people, but it's not something that they've had as much demand for. Because, of course, if, if you're in Bristol, you've got a big city, you've got you know, a population of over 200 trans people. Um, if you're in Wiltshire, first of all, you have to deal with the geography of Wiltshire and secondly, um, you, your trans population is not as, as large. So there are, uh, there are issues with that. But health watch have, have been very helpful. Um, working with NHS trusts is more complicated. Um, they inevitably have um, both financial and political concerns. Uh, working with CCGs is proving very difficult indeed. Um, I'm sure that they have a whole bunch of issues that they're grappling with, but they do seem to be very reluctant to engage with trans people. Uh, any other any final questions? questions? Okay, while I'm up here, um, in the slides, which uh, Isla has copies of, I've got some recommendations of resources for you. So first of all, the Gender Identity Research and Education Society, they've been around a long time. It was set up by the parents of uh, a young trans woman um, because when, when she came out, they were horrified at, at the discrimination that she faced. And they've got a lot of research that they've done. They've been advisors to government and so on and so forth. They've also got some, some good e-learning. Um, it's really good e-learning stuff, which used to be on the Royal College of GPs website and sadly has had to be withdrawn because the college meddled with it uh, without Jaira's permission. 
Uh, Mermaids is an organisation for trans young people and their families, so wonderful, supportive people. They recently got a, a big grant from the, the lottery fund. Um, the serious medical staff will all come through the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. They have an annual conference around the world. There's also a European conference which is taking place in Rome in April, which I'd love to go to, but actually they're, they're having it at Rome Airport to stop people from doing <laughs> tourism rather than going to the conference, so maybe not. <laughs> um, uh, Pink Therapy is an organisation for therapists of all sorts that specialise in LGBT stuff, so they're good people to talk to if you need a therapist. Uh, and then the Stonewall Report about uh, trans life in Britain. Um, if you want to see actual trans people, um, the My Generation project was set up by a couple of, of trans people in Brighton who had some experience. So they wanted to get into to movies and stuff, so they started making films, short films interviewing trans people. There are now lots of those on YouTube. Um, we have our own films that we've made, and also the local youth group in Bristol has made a nice little film about gender. So that's all worth... And the, um, there are people out there with, with one of the tables whose name escapes me at the moment, but they're working with Oxford University again to interview young trans people. Health, yeah, yeah. So Health Talk, that's them. Um, so they're producing some of this stuff at the moment, and when that's available, that again will be a very useful thing to have. And that's how to find us. Anybody thought of a question while I've been babbling? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yep, and if you think of a question later, you can always email us, and that will come through to me, and I will answer it. Lovely. Thank you very much for a really insightful and honest and humorous presentation. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Cheryl.